On today's program, I'm challenging you to consider an important question. Why do most professing Christians observe holidays that were never kept by Jesus and His Apostles, that are steeped in pagan traditions, and at the same time they forsake the observance of the holy days found in the Bible and the ones that Jesus kept? Doesn't matter which days we observe as long as we get time off work. Go to parties and enjoy wonderful meals with family and friends. The answer is simple. It does matter, and here's why. The seven annual biblically commanded festivals predict future events. They reveal God's master plan for humanity. They explain the big questions that trouble many. For example, do you wonder what happens to your friends and loved ones who are not saved? The answer is found in the biblical holy days, and it's not what most people think. If you want to learn the answers to some of life's most troubling questions, and if you want to know the future just ahead of us, you don't want to miss today's program. Welcome again to Tomorrow's World. This is the first of a three-part series on the Biblical Holy Days. We'll see how they have profound meaning for you and your loved ones and for all of humanity. Be prepared to be surprised. The Biblical Holy Days and festivals are so rich in meaning that we only have time today to explain two of the seven. So let's get to it. Biblical festival number one is Passover. The Passover is an observance kept by Jesus, His twelve apostles, the Apostle Paul, and the Gentile church at Corinth, as well as the first century church in general. But to understand it, we have to go back in time, a long time, to understand events that were to occur centuries later. The time was about 1440 B.C., and the place was Egypt. The descendants of the man known as Israel were slaves in the land of Egypt. Life was harsh, and they cried out for freedom. God sent Moses with a message to Pharaoh, Let my people go. Who was this Moses demanding such a thing? What Pharaoh didn't understand at the beginning was that the author of this demand was more than man. Bible students know that God used Moses to bring nine awesome plagues on Egypt, making life miserable and destroying crops and livestock but Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. That required a tenth plague, and it has relevance for you and me. Here is how that plague was announced to Pharaoh in Exodus, the 11th chapter, verses 4 to 7. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. How could such a separation between the Israelites and Egyptians occur? Israelites were instructed to set aside a yearling lamb and slaughter it at twilight. They were to take some of the blood and paint it above the door and on the sides of their doors. Then they were to roast and eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and remain in their homes until daybreak. Exodus 12, verse 29 reveals what happened to the Egyptians and anyone who failed to follow these instructions. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. Jews and some Christians memorialize this event to this day, but do you understand its significance? Passover is only the first of seven annual festivals given to Israel, but it has meaning far beyond that time and that of a single nation. Nearly 1,500 years later, another Savior came in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior not of Israel only, but of all nations and peoples, and Passover would take on greater significance. Around the age of 30, Jesus of Nazareth began preaching the gospel, meaning the good news of the kingdom of God. He performed such genuine and remarkable miracles that even his critics admitted they were the work of God. 
Notice that when a ruler of the Jews came secretly at night to Jesus, he confessed the following, John the third chapter, verse two. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. But after three and a half years, jealousy and resentment drove the Jews to turn him over to the Romans to be put to death. This is well known by anyone who reads the New Testament of the Bible. But what is not generally understood is the timing of His death by crucifixion. It was Jesus' habit to observe the Passover each year in Jerusalem. Notice it in Luke, the second chapter, in verses 41 and 42. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when He was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Jesus continued to observe the Passover throughout His life, and at the end of His three and a half year ministry, He was again in Jerusalem for the Passover. But this would be no ordinary Passover. Professing Christians often speak of the Last Supper, which Jesus ate with the disciples. But few realize that this was not just any supper, but was in fact the Passover. While Jesus' disciples were remembering the events of the Exodus, Jesus was looking to the future. He got up and washed the disciples' feet, something that was normally done by the lowest servant of the household. This was to teach us that we are to live a life of humble service to others. Then He instituted what should properly be called the New Testament Passover. Matthew 26 and verses 26 to 28. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What significance does this have for you and me? I'll answer that question in a moment, but I want to tell you about our informative booklet, The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. Without the knowledge of these biblical holy days, it is impossible to understand the big picture of what God is doing here on earth. Professing Christianity has thrown out these days and slapped the name of Christ on pagan days. And in doing so, they've lost the keys to God's master plan. If you're serious about learning about what God is doing here below, call now for The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. It's absolutely free of charge, and I'll be right back to explain the significance of Passover and give you the next festival in God's Master Plan. Today's offer is yours absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. Call now. 1-800-236-0531. Call toll free now or write to us at the address on your screen or visit us online at tomorrowsworld.org. With this offer you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Then be sure to go to tomorrowsworld.org forward slash digital. Have a digital subscription sent right to your email inbox faster than postal mail. Visit us online now. We've been looking at the first of seven biblical festivals days that are neglected by mainstream Christianity. As seen, the Passover was introduced to ancient Israel at the time of their exodus from Egypt, but it was also kept by Jesus, His Apostles, and the New Testament Church of God. What's the significance of this for us today? After Jesus and His disciples ate the Passover meal, Jesus took His disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was here that Judas, one of the twelve, betrayed Him. The contingent of soldiers that accompanied Judas took him into custody, brutally beat him, and finally crucified him. Consider the significance of the timing. We know that there are 365 days in a year, and Passover is only one day. So consider the odds 
of this just happening to be on Passover. Remember that the Bible counts time from sunset to sunset. So Jesus' betrayal, beating, trial, and crucifixion all took place on the Passover. Was this coincidence? Not at all. The symbolism should be obvious. Several years earlier, John the Baptist saw Jesus and announced to those with him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In this statement, we come to understand the role Jesus would play out in his life. The slaughtered Passover lambs were a type of what Jesus Christ would do for the world. The blood of Christ would protect those who belonged to him, just as the blood of the lamb protected the Israelites of the Exodus. That Jesus was the antitype of the Passover lamb is stated plainly in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. To fully understand what it means for Christ to be our Passover, we must understand the problem of sin. According to 1 John 3, 4, Whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Paul tells us we earn something when we break God's law, which as we have just seen is a definition of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, we are under the death penalty. As Paul further explains in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's a truth that few professing Christians understand. Yet the New Testament is emphatic on this subject. Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. He is the one who created the entire universe. He is the one who gave life to our first parents. And He is the one who spoke the Ten Commandments to ancient Israel. He is therefore the one whose life is so valuable that He could give His life in exchange for our lives. All of this is confirmed in the first chapter of Colossians. Speaking of Christ, it tells us in chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. And if that is not plain enough, here it is in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, when speaking of Israel during the Exodus. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Can anything be more easily understood? The one who we think of as the God of the Old Testament was none other than the one who came to give His life for us. Jesus Christ came into this world to be the reality of that Passover lamb. He was brutally slaughtered to pay the penalty brought upon us when we sinned. He gave His life in exchange for ours, and all this happened on the day of the Passover. That ancient ceremony pointed to a more perfect Lamb to come. A true Christian enters into a new covenant by the blood of Christ, and the Passover is a memorial of that covenant, celebrated each year on the 14th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar. Whenever we do this, we remember the Lord's death until He comes. All this naturally leads us to the second biblical festival, which explains what our response ought to be to the murder of our Creator. But first, I want to remind you of today's offer, The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. Millions read the Bible, but don't understand the big picture found in its pages. The reason? They disregard the days God commands. The Holy Days, God's Master Plan, opens up a new world of understanding. So order your copy today. Simply call our toll-free number. It's absolutely free of charge. And I'll be back in 15 seconds to tell you about the next biblical festival and how it explains how we ought to respond to God's Passover sacrifice. 
Today's offer is yours absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. Visit us online at tomorrowsworld.org. Find us on Facebook, watch us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We've looked at the Passover in this first series on the Biblical Holy Days. We've seen that at the time of Israel's exodus from Egypt, that they slaughtered an innocent lamb and painted its blood around their doors so that death would pass over them. We've also seen that this was a type of the true Lamb of God to come nearly 1,500 years later. And we've seen that the one crucified, Jesus Christ, was the Creator of life. The question now arises, what should be our response? This is where many professing Christians go off the rail. Perhaps you too have accepted the very clever but deceptive doctrine that teaches that the law of God was done away at the crucifixion, that Christ nailed it to the cross. Yet Jesus Himself testified in Matthew 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Some try to say that fulfill means that He kept the law so that we don't have to. But the remainder of His instructions found in this same chapter demonstrate that instead of doing away with the law, He made it more binding and more difficult to keep. For example, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And when a young man came to Jesus wanting to know what good thing he could do to attain eternal life, what did Jesus tell him? But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus further stated in Luke 6, 46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Now what does this have to do with the biblical festivals? It has everything to do with them. The next festival following Passover is the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now I know that sounds strange to many who are not familiar with the Bible. People read right over references to these special days and pay no attention to them. After the Passover, the children of Israel were still in Egypt as slaves but the Egyptians wanted to have no more to do with them, and they thrust them out. It took them seven days to completely leave Egypt, and during that time they had no time to let their bread rise, hence the festival of unleavened bread. Now it's right to wonder what this has to do with Jesus Christ and to our lives. Isn't this old covenant stuff for which we need not be concerned? Not at all. For example, Jesus not only kept the Passover throughout His life, but He also kept the days of unleavened bread. As we read earlier, Jesus kept the Passover with His parents. Notice this again from Luke. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when He was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now let's continue with the beginning of the next verse. And when they had finished the days. Passover is a single day, but the seven days that follow Passover are known as the days of unleavened bread. These two feasts, Passover and unleavened bread, are so closely associated that it's evident that both were intended to be kept. We see this in the Apostle Paul's instructions to the Gentile Corinthians Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us." Now carefully note the next verse. Remember this is written to Gentiles, not Jews. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven is a symbol of sin. We understand that by keeping this feast we are to put sin out of our lives. But what is sin? According to the Apostle John, known as the Apostle of Love, sin is the transgression of the law. 
Now consider, if the law is done away, then there is no sin. That's the only logical conclusion one can come to. As Paul explains in Romans 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. That's why those who tell us that we don't need to keep the law of God misunderstand the Scriptures. Admittedly, Paul wrote some things that are difficult to understand. Sometimes he seems to say that we are to keep the law, and other times that we don't. However, reading all his words in context and reading the remainder of the Scriptures, we can see that God's law is still in effect. I told you before the break that I would show from the Bible that the law of God is still in effect today. The Apostle John is known as the Apostle of Love because he wrote about love. What too few seem to understand is that he never spoke of love apart from the law of God. In fact, he wrote about the need to keep the law about as much as he wrote about love. Notice this in 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The Feast of Unleavened Bread teaches us that we must respond to the sacrifice of Christ by repenting, by coming out of sin. We must not remain in spiritual Egypt. We must put sin out of our lives. The command to repent is found throughout the New Testament. Jesus declared in Mark, the first chapter, and verse 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And on the day of Pentecost, a feast day that I'll be explaining in the next telecast in this series, the Apostle Peter convicted a large number of Jews that they were guilty of murdering the Messiah. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what was Peter's response? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Passover pointed to the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. The days of unleavened bread teach us that our response to that perfect sacrifice is to repent, to come out of sin, to leave the leaven of malice and wickedness behind. But there is another important lesson taught by these days. There are seven days of unleavened bread. Coming out of sin takes effort on our part. It means forsaking our past way of life and coming up to a new person. The Israelites passed through the Red Sea on the seventh day of unleavened bread, and this has great significance for you and me. Notice it in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So this seventh day reminds us of our need to be baptized, to put to death our old man in a watery grave and to come up as a new person. The two festivals, Passover and Unleavened Bread, along with the next festival in God's plan, are summed up in Peter's command to the Jews who came to repentance on the day of Pentecost. In Acts the second chapter, beginning verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is Passover. Peter convicted them of their sins. They were cut to the heart. Then Peter tells them what their response to Christ's sacrifice ought to be. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's unleavened bread. But the master plan is not yet finished. 
Peter went on to say that something would follow their genuine heartfelt repentance and baptism. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is greatly misunderstood and is only a part of the meaning of the next biblical festival. I'll explain the true meaning of Pentecost in the next of this series. Until then, be sure to order your copy of The Holy Days, God's Master Plan.